All right, so thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. This is the Literature Review and Source Evaluation Strategies Workshop. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Amanda Hoffman with the Education Psychology Leadership and Higher Education Department. Um, please enjoy our final workshop of this afternoon's Grad Rebel Writing Boot Camp, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Hoffman. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. In, okay, perfect. So um, thank you all for um, coming today. Um, like um, was said, my name is Dr. Amanda Hoffman. I actually uh, changed uh, jobs over the summer. So I am now working as a research associate in the National Institute for the Advancement of Education in the College of Education here at UNLV. But previously I did um, teach within the ed psych department in uh, the College of Education specifically focused on uh, research, introductory research methods and introductory statistics. Um, and so I gave a similar presentation to this, I think in the spring or the fall, I can't remember, um, but I want to um, like the description of the, the workshop said, you're all pretty much expected to write literature reviews, right? Whether that be in your classes or in your for your dissertation or your thesis or whatever you are working on um you're expected to write this lit review but nobody really ever teaches you how to do that and so you kind of go in there with not really good guidance of what to um uh, to do when you are putting together your literature review and so what i wanted to do today was talk about um just giving you a general introduction to what the literature review is. And then we'll go through how to, a quick overview about how, oh, so here's my agenda for the day. For the workshop is uh, first, what is the literature review? What isn't the literature review? Uh, then we're gonna go into a quick overview about how to find sources. Um, then we're gonna go into um, some important reading strategies when you are reading academic literature. Um, this is a big one, and I think it's not talked about enough, is evaluating your sources. Just because you find an article on Google Scholar does not mean it's an article that is good or is useful to you. Um, and then, actually, I forgot to put it in the bullet point here, but we're going to talk about like putting together the literature review and kind of um, writing that paper. And so I have a space for questions at the end. If you want to hold those in the questions until the end, that would be really helpful for me. So first, what is the literature review? And why do we have to do that in the first place? Does anyone have any ideas about why you're doing a uh, literature review in the first place? Oh, perfect. To identify gaps in your literature, right? Um, Everyone knows that the literature, I mean, I'm sure not everybody knows, but at least for me, the literature review is not always the most fun part of the um, research process, right? It can be very tedious, but we really need to do that to help focus our research. Um, again, another good point in the chat is that we're setting the framework, right? So we're putting our research project into context. So it um, is important to know what's happening in the field before you start on research. Um, so you need to know what kind of questions are other people in your field asking? Um, what kind of um, methodologies are they using in the past? Um, so that way you can then, like you said, identify those gaps in the literature where your research will be important. And so a big part of that too is that um, you wanna know what other people are doing so that you don't recreate the wheel, right? Research is a very time, labor and cost intensive process. And so if you spend years working on a project to find out that somebody wrote that paper in 1996, that's a, a lot of time, investment, um, a lot of, cost investment, things like that, that could have been saved if you just did some research uh, or some depth of uh, analysis in the literature in your field. And so uh, I know that's personally a bigger pet peeve of mine is that we don't often publish 
non-significant results. So results that don't get that reach that 0 0.05. Um, significance level if you're doing statistical analysis. Um, but there could be um, other places that you might find that literature, whether it be in a conference paper presentation or in gray literature, things like that, so that you are finding um, all, the, all the previous work done on your field so you know uh, where to start. Um, and so there's different types of literature reviews. So the one that you probably will be doing most often is a narrative literature review. That's that second part. That's really just going through the, the studies that have been done on and kind of giving the story, telling the story of your field and your research question and your research problem. And so you were, again, uh, just going through and looking at um, what's happening currently and what's happened in the past in the fields. A systematic literature review is a little bit more in depth process where you're really trying to find the most important papers that um, and really trying to dig down deep into your topic, not just giving the general overview, but really digging deep down into answer. So the systematic literature review uses the review of the literature to answer a question. Whereas the narrative literature review is just telling the story. A meta-analysis is similar to a systematic review. Here though, you're going one step further in, and you're taking the literature and you're doing a statistical analysis on those results to say what is the average effect of whatever, maybe it's an intervention that you're doing, maybe it's a, uh, you wanna understand what's the average increase in um, motivation over time, things like that. So uh, the, um, the meta-analysis takes that systematic review and takes it one step further to add in that statistical analysis. Another type is a critical literature review. And so here you're really, like the, the title explains, you're being critical of the field and of the studies that you're uh, putting into your literature review. So are they asking the right questions? Are they doing the right methodology? Have they read all the um, important literature? Things like that. And making sure that you are um, telling the story with a more critical lens. And then the another big one is looking at theoretical a theoretical um, literature review. So uh, my uh, substantive background is in academic motivation. And so a theoretical literature review would look more at the, um, the theory-driven papers rather than the empirical-driven papers. So we're really digging down into what does it mean to, um, for, to define self-efficacy, to define um, self-determination, things like that, really defining the theory. And an integrative uh, literature review will kind of combine those theoretical papers and the um, empirical papers and kind of get more towards that narrative um, literature review. And so a big part of understanding the literature review is understanding what the literature review is not. And so here is where it's important to uh, call out the fundamental quality of synthesis in your literature reviews. So um, when I'm teaching my introductory research methods class um, in the past, what I've seen a lot is that people will think of a literature review almost in what my uh, instructor taught me when I was in my uh, master's program was um, she called it book report style. And so it's not what a literature review isn't, is not just you saying, Paper one was this, and then summarizing and going through these analysis of each paper one by one. Instead, you need to be able to synthesize your literature. You want to bring all your ideas together and say that uh, papers one, two, and three said this about my topic, while paper four said something totally opposite. And so you are not necessarily, like I said, not just one by one bullet pointing about the, the literature that you've read, but really integrating you, what you've read and said, this article A really informed 
the research that Article B did. And so, um, again, synthesizing is a big, big, big part of writing a literature review. And so how will this help you in your research? So like we said before, it will help you to identify gaps in the literature where your research can fit. And we will talk a little bit later about the structure of the literature review and what it should look like. But in the end, what the literature review, review should really do is help you to define your research questions. You might go into the literature review thinking that you want to ask a specific question, but you might find that that's already that research question has already been answered. And so maybe you need to answer it in a different way or you need to slightly tweak that research question based on what you found during the literature review. Again, it will also not only help inform your research questions, but it will help inform your research methodology. So maybe you're interested in understanding, again, I come from the education side and my other substantive interest is in um, uh, college athletes. And so um, there's been some research done about academic motivation in college athletes, but I then, no one had ever used, a, I use a specific uh, modeling technique called log linear Bat Bradley Terry modeling. And no one in education has used that before. And so by reviewing the research, I can know that my, my contribution to the field is novel because no one else has used it before. And so once you kind of understand what the literature review is and why it's important, oops, sorry. The literature review will help you to define your research question. And so let me go back to the screen that I'm sharing. Awesome. So now that you've, you know what the uh, purpose of the literature review is and why it will be important in your field or in your work, excuse me, the first thing you need to do is go about finding and managing your literature. And so first you wanna make sure you know how to search. And so for a long time, I was not always great at this. Um, you wanna make sure that you have a plan when you're going into researching. And so you wanna make sure you know what journals that you wanna look at, what are the keywords you wanna search, um, who are maybe some important figures that you know from your co coursework that will be useful for you when looking for a literature review. Um, if you just put things into Google Scholar or into the library website, you're going to um, spend a lot of time clicking and reading abstracts and um, kind of it's a little chaotic if you don't go in with a with a set research plan and it can take you longer to do this research search than you would want to do. And so you want to make sure that you're being strategic with your time and having that plan will help you do so. In addition to making your plan, you want to make sure that you effectively use your resources. So in within the library, you're, you will have a field-specific librarian that can help you to do this research process. And so um, I know in the College of Ed, we have Amanda and Samantha. Um, and so it, you want to make sure when you're going in the library website that you can look for your college specific librarian and they can help you craft that plan to look for research. Um, their whole job is to help you all be successful in, in your research. And so you want to make sure that you're uh, taking advantage of those resources um, to, again, strategically manage your time so that you are not, again, just being chaotic in your research search and you're actually doing it in a meaningful um, methodological way. Um, and then there are some strategies about how you can um, search for literature. And so uh, making sure that you're using the correct keywords is important, um, using Boolean phrases. So if you are, again, like I said, I'm interested in academic motivation and college athletes. And so what I would do is when I'm either looking on Google Scholar or on the library website, I would put together 
academic motivation and making sure that I put, if you're using multiple words and you want to make sure that they're grouped together, you want to make sure you put quotation marks around all the words that should be grouped together. So that way it doesn't just find you uh, results for everything that's related to college, everything that's related to athletes and everything that's related to college athletes. I would put quotations around college athletes to make sure that it limits my search to just that topic. Um, you can also use a um, an asterisk at the end of any phrase that you're interested in that might have different endings. So if you're interested in knowing about studying or just study, um, you would type in study and then put an asterisk after the one. And that will help you to search any literature that has that phrase with any different ending. And so it's important to make sure that you're using those strategies when you are searching so that you can um, find the best articles for your, your work. Because you'll see when you go on the, liter the library website that if you just type in a word, it can bring up almost probably millions of articles, right? And so that can feel daunting when you first look at the library website. And so you want to make sure that you're refining your terms as much as you can so that maybe you're bringing up a hundred articles or a thousand articles, and then you can go through and we'll go through about strategies for reading and you can read the abstracts to make sure that they're relevant for your paper. Um, so where to search? Um, so the UNLV library website is amazing. Um, and we have access to a lot of really great journals and a really great and really great databases. Um, Google Scholar is an option. Um, excuse me. And so just again, making sure that you're using the correct um, search terms when you're doing that within the database or in the library or Google Scholar. Um, a big one is using other work. And you can do this. I use Google Scholar for this a lot. Um, is that you can look up what articles were cited within the paper, and you can look up what papers in the future cited your cited the paper that you're looking up. And so um, I personally study self-efficacy. And so Band Albert Bandura is the kind of seminal researcher and like theoretical um, creator of that um, theory. And so I would look up his 1977 book about um, self-efficacy. And then there's a button that says cited by 50,000 or however many people have cited his work. And then I can look through those articles. And on Google Scholar, once you've clicked on the cited articles, you can then search within those cited articles for even a more specific topic. Um, once you've found your literature, um, how do you go about managing it? Um, citation managers can, again, be very, very helpful in uh, managing your time and managing your cognitive load. Um, I am not great at this, um, to be honest. I am still a person that uh, looks up everything and types up my citations um, pa uh, paper by paper. That's not always great, right? So um, using something like Zotero or Mendeley or EndNote can really be helpful for you to, um, when you're putting all of your, so every time you write cite in your paper as you're writing it, you can then go back and make sure that you're citing the right piece of literature and a lot of them have integrations with uh, Microsoft Word. I know I used Mendel I use Mendeley, and Mendeley has a really good um, integration with Microsoft Word. That whenever I type a, a parenthetical citation, once I type that, I once I click that from the integration, I can just go down to the end of the paper, and there's an option up at the top that says like repopulate my bibliography or my reference list based on what I've cited in my parenthetical citations. Um, so that can just be really helpful for you when you are um, maybe trying to finish a paper at the last minute and you need to finish your research list. I know I, that I procrastinate on my reference list. Um, and so those kind of tools can be really helpful when you're managing your citations and your literature. 
but also either within the uh, citation manager, a lot of times you can do annotations straight in your um, citation manager, or if it makes more sense to you to create a, an Excel spreadsheet that has all of your papers with these annotations. Annotating is very important when you're trying to organize your literature. You wanna put together maybe a one or two paragraph summary of what the paper was talking about, the main the main points, maybe the sample that they used, the, the methodology that they used, things like that. So that way when you are referencing uh, or trying to remember, oh, was it Bandora 1977 or was it Bandora 1985? which paper do you need to cite? You can go either in your annotation, in your citation manager or in your Excel spreadsheet and find the exact paper that you're looking for. Once you've found the literature, the next uh, hardest thing is um, reading it, right? So reading articles is not an easy task, especially if it's not something that you're used to or something that you haven't done in a really long time. Um, and so the first thing that you want to recognize is the structure of academic articles. And so the one that is used most often is what's called IMRAD. So the I stands for the introduction, M is methods, R is results, and is the little A, and D is the discussion. And so most academic articles that you read will follow this structure. And so once you, you know what to identify, then you can go into these strategies for reading. And so the first thing is the reading order. And I think there's a number of different ways that you can go about reading an academic article. And again, you have to do what makes sense for you what I would say is to not read word for word from top to bottom, especially as a new researcher and especially as somebody who's reading articles for the first time. Um, reading word for word, top to bottom, will not only take forever, but it will also probably confuse you. Because I, if you're taking, um, maybe for my, my students who are taking research methods, set one uh, their introductory research methods class, They've never taken an introductory stats class. They've never done an introductory qualitative methods class, things like that. So when they get to the methodology section, it can be overwhelming and frustrating to read because it can be confusing. And so you wanna make sure that you read in an order that um, doesn't overwhelm you like that. And so what I personally like to do is I like to read the introduction first, then I read the, um, conclusion or the discussion, whatever they have in their paper. Um, then I like to go back up to the methods and the results. Um, and then I personally like to read the abstract last to see if it matches what I am, um, what I've already read. Um, but again, you have to kind of make the decision that works best for you. A lot of people will say, read the abstract first then go into the introduction, the discussion, the methods, and the results. Um, and so sometimes uh, um, I like to read methods before results because I want to make sure that the results match what they said they were going to do in the method section. But again, if you are not familiar with those methods yet, sometimes reading about a long linear Bradley-Terry model or a, a structural equation model or a... a phenomenological uh, analysis of uh, qualitative results can be, again, confusing because you're not sure what that means. And so if you just wanna read the results after the discussion, that would that you can see why they're making the points they made in the discussion based on their results. Um, I would uh, argue to skim the, the article first before you do any deep reading. Um, not only to make sure that the article is important for your work, you don't wanna spend hours reading something and, and then find out that it really isn't applicable to your work at all. Um, I think people are getting a lot better at coming up with interesting article names. And so they're almost clickbaity in a way that they come up with this really cool article um, title and then you read the abstract and you're like, actually this has nothing to do with what I want to do or what I want to talk about. And so you want to make sure that you're at least reading things to make sure that it is important for your work. 
um, skimming that, and then going in for a second Passover to do some deep reading. Um, again, pinpointing the main points, and this can be where you do your annotation. Um, again, a quick summary of what their they were, what was their question, what did they say about that, well, how did they answer that question, and um, how does it relate to the other uh, research that's already being done, and that's where the, the discussion will come in. Um, and then the big piece here is intentional highlighting. I, when I first started my grad program, I, and even an undergrad, I think I just highlighted because I thought that I needed to highlight. Um, and, but if you're just highlighting something and not making notes either in the margin or in a, in a notebook somewhere or in a, um, in an annotation, when you go back to read that paper again in maybe two months when you're finishing your paper or five years when you are using it again in a different part on a different project, you might not remember why you highlighted something. And so you want to make sure that you're connecting those highlights in your articles or in your books to a point that you're making in, in writing somewhere. And then last thing here, again, like I said at the beginning of this slide is that articles, academic articles are not easy reads. They can be dense, they can be dry, they can be confusing. And so you wanna make sure when you're reading articles that you're giving yourself grace, not only cognitively, but also like emotionally and saying like, you wanna give yourself breaks. You can't spend a day reading academic articles. Your, your brain is going to malfunction and your eyes are going to get um, loopy. And so you wanna make sure that you are, um, giving yourself enough time to read academic articles. And um, so what I do for my research methods class is I have students annotate at least one article a week, at least during my summer class. In my regular semester, they do three every three weeks. Um, and so at least annotate one article a week so that it's not December 4th and your final paper is due on December 7th and you're reading, trying to jam pack all this information from academic articles in when your brain can't really process it all then. Um, but also giving yourself grace kind of emotionally to say, this person who wrote this academic article might have been working in the field for 20, 30, 40 years, right? And so they really know what they're talking about and they've studied this a lot. And so if you don't understand it on the first pass, that's okay. You, you it's, it, if you do, that's great, but it, it, it might not hit the first time and that's okay. So maybe you set it down for that night and you come back to it later in the, in the, in a week or in a few days and say, okay, let me give my brain some time to process this and then we'll come back to it later. When you are reading and after you are reading, you want to make sure that you are evaluating the sources that you are reading. Um, not every article that you read has to go into your literature review all the time, right? And some of them you will read and you'll say, I'll never use this source. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are evaluating them as you read them and after you read them to know exactly your literature review is not better the more articles you use. And so like in my current summer class, somebody asked me, what is the minimum article length? Like how many articles do they need to use for their final paper? And so for me, I don't think it's important to say eight to 10 minimum, because a lot of times people will stop at after eight or 10, but really you want to make sure that you're getting for a class paper, maybe you use less, but when you're writing things like your thesis or your dissertation, you want to make sure that you get a full perspective of what's happening in the field. And so you need more articles. But just including an article to include an article doesn't make sense. And it's going to make your writing look discombobulated almost. And so when you're evaluating sources, the first thing you want to check for is relevance. Again, is this paper connected to my topic? whether that be in a tertiary way or a primary way, um, you never know from just reading the abstract if it's going to be useful to you, right? And you don't wanna discredit articles that might not be useful for your specific purpose on this time, right? 
You want them because they might be helpful. There might be something in their methodology section or in their discussion that you can use, whether that be for the topic and the content itself or just stylistically. You can only get better as a writer by reading other people's writing. And so um, even though it might not be connected to your current topic, it might be related to something that you might do in the future or um, something that you've done in the past. And so you want to make sure when you're deciding what articles to include in your literature review, you want to make sure you use the ones that are very connected to your current topic and your current research question. Um, most importantly, you want to make sure that your sources are credible and reliable and uh, useful. And so the main things that I tell my students to look for when they're evaluating credibility of a source is, um, of an article, excuse me, is think about the source where the article is being published. So is it a peer reviewed journal or is it just somebody's blog? Um, they should make um, mention in their articles if they received funding in any way for the, um, for the research project. And so you wanna make sure, is that is that funding coming from a source that might introduce some bias into the results? Um, and you wanna make sure that um, the where the journal is being published is um, it, not independent per se, but you have to evaluate where that journal is being published. And so a lot of, uh, uni a lot of academic journals will be housed at an, indiv at an individual university. And so you can know that, that it's not, the university itself is not influencing the results in any way. But if you're reading a paper about cancer research and it was sponsored by Johnson & Johnson and it was the um, their new drug that they were looking at um, assessing, you just kind of want to, not that it's a bad source to use, but you just want to look at things like that with a grain of salt and say, oh, well, if this person sponsored the study, then maybe that there was some political nature of, of what could be published in the results. But that doesn't mean you can't use the source. You just, again, want to make sure when you're writing your paper that you're clear about that. And when you are thinking about how to use the information that you think about it. Next, you want to think about who the author of the source is. And so um, maybe uh, when you're reading and um, you find an article from a specific author. Um, you can go and look at their other things that they've published. Is this the first time they've ever written about a certain topic or have they been published in multiple other articles talking about the same topic? And that can kind of help you to determine whether that they can, they're the expert in the field. Again, it doesn't make the paper bad if it's their first time publishing. Right, It might be a new early career researcher or grad student. That doesn't make the article bad or the person not credible, but you just have to think about um, their qualifications when, um, when reading their articles. And so uh, I taught the undergraduate seminar in the College of Education, and we talk about authority is constructed, being constructed. And so... If I was to write a paper about academic motivation, I have a PhD in ed psych and I've um, worked in different um, fields with academic motivation. Um, but if I tried to write a paper about biology, right, even though I have a PhD and I'm a credible source, I'm not credible on everything. And so you want to make sure that the, the topic that somebody's writing about is germane to what they do every day. Um, next is the date of the um, uh, the paper that you're reading. Um, I give the suggestion that you wanna make sure that most of the literature that you're using is within the last 10 years, um, but you can't not use seminal pieces to your work. Again, like I said earlier, Albert Brindora wrote about self-advocacy in 1977. Um, and so that's a, a, a topic or a, a source that I would need to use in my literature review, even though it's much older than that 10 year suggestion. But if you were doing research on, um, I'm trying to think of what it could be thing, but ideas change and what we know to be fact has, it changes over time. And so if you're writing about something 
and you are using sources from like the 40s or the 50s, other than being seminal pieces, you want to make sure you limit those pieces that are too far out of date because the ideas and the, the norms will change over time. Um, again, with that, um, going back to what I just said about Vandora, you want to check the reference list of the um, of the papers that you're reading to make sure that they're including those seminal pieces, right? If I were reading a paper about self-determination theory, which is another um, academic motivation theory, and they didn't include Desi and Ryan, who wrote the theory, then I would have to second guess their knowledge of the topic, right? And so you want to make sure that they're using the important seminal pieces um, when they're doing their own literature review. Um, next and last here is evaluating the methods. Um, so you want to make sure that the methods that they're using are make sense for the questions that they're asking. And so I am a quantitative methodologist most of the time. And so if I see a... Uh, um, a paper saying that they are going to give a cause and effect. They they make a cause and effect declarative statement in their discussion or in their that they say that that's what they're going to do. But then they use correlational methods. I can know that maybe they aren't super clear on what they can do to answer their question. And so again, this part of evaluating your sources might be something that you come you are better at evaluating as you advance in your um in your work because if you've never taken stats before you could not you might not know if it's an appropriate methodology but this is where it's important to either talk to an, an older student or your advisor or your teachers from your classes to say like oh i read this paper they said this and they used this method does that make sense and so if they tell you, absolutely not, that doesn't make sense at all, then you can, again, kind of look at that paper with a grain of salt. And then lastly, once you have found your sources, you've read them, you've evaluated them, you've decided what um, articles you're going to use, and that is not a linear process, right? You could, while you're writing your literature review, you should still be reading the literature to say, oh, maybe this will be part of my, this can be added to my lit review, or um, this makes more sense to include in my research than some other paper that you've already read. It should be a continuous learning process. Um, and so, but while you're writing your paper, um, the first thing you have to decide is um, on what type of paper, of literature your review you wanna do. So thinking back to that narrative or systematic, theoretical, things like that, and your structure. So I personally, when I'm writing literature reviews, thinking about it, most of the time I organize them thematically. So I say, I'm going to write a whole section about academic motivation. Then I'm going to narrow it down to co college athletes, motivation, things like that. And I approach it thematically. Or you can decide to go at it um, chronologically. And you, so this would be, so theoret like a theoretical literature, you could be done really well chronologically and say, Early in my field, they thought this theoretically. And then later they found out more evidence and they changed their theory. This new theory came out, things like that. So you can organize it either thematically or chronologically. It, again, just make whatever fits for you and whatever fits most in your field. Um, an important part here is this V pattern. Um, this will be especially important if you're deciding to um, cover your structure of paper thematically is you want to start your literature review very broad and say, so again, using my um, research as an example, I study academic motivation. And then you narrow it down and you say, I study academic self-efficacy. Then you narrow it down a little bit more and you say, I study academic self-efficacy in college athletes. And then um, my dissertation was about academic self-efficacy for self-regulated learning in college athletes. Right. And so you keep narrowing down your focus and eventually you'll find that by narrowing it down, you'll get this V pattern and your arrow will almost point exactly and should lead very logically into the research questions that you want to answer. And you say you would say based on the review of literature, we noticed that there is a lack of understanding about 
um, academic self-efficacy for self-regulated learning in college athletes. Therefore, this project will answer the following questions, one, two, three, four, or however many questions you have. Going back to what I said before about synthesis, you want to make sure you're bringing sources together. And so you can do this in a number of ways. Do these three sources agree with each other? Do they disagree with each other? Do, do they answer different questions that you've been asking? Things like that. And um, you want to make sure that you are not only focusing on the research that agrees with your hypothesis or your research questions. By including research that also doesn't agree with what you think, it shows that you did your due diligence and you're looking through all of the literature and saying, well, this article may say X, I believe the opposite of that and Y, and this is how I'm going to show that. A big thing, um, especially if you're working with um, human subjects, is you want to be aware of samples. Um, and so if you are writing a literature, again, I, I, I wrote my literature review for my dissertation about um, college athletes and academic motivation, and I found a really great paper, but it worked. Their sample was on fifth to eighth graders, right? And so that doesn't mean I can't include that paper in my literature review. But again, you just want to make sure that you are including that in information when you're writing about the paper so that people, when they're reading your literature review, they don't assume that all of your sources were about the same sample. You want to make sure that the samples, you are clear about what the findings were and who those findings were on. Because if you want to study, let's say, the experience, let's say you're doing a project on reading um, reading levels in Southern Nevada, right? And you find a great piece about this intervention, reading intervention that was implemented, but it was implemented in schools in rural Montana, right? You, If you just write a, this, so X reading intervention increased reading scores by so many points, people are going to assume that it's about the sample that you're specifically looking at. And so you wanna make sure that you're clear and transparent in writing your literature review that yes, this is true of this reading intervention, but it was with this other population. And we maybe wanna see, does it work in our, on our population? And then lastly, I think it's really important to, um, to note the amount of quotations you're using in your literature review. The literature review should be in your voice. And so you want to limit the amount of direct quotations within your paper. Instead, what your literature review should be doing is paraphrasing and bringing those, again, bringing your sources together that say, research says that this reading intervention has uh, increases reading scores by such and such, right? But you don't want to directly quote from the papers unless it's absolutely necessary because you want to make sure, again, that this is coming from you, not just a, well, this research said this and then quoting it. And then this, re this article said this and quoting it. You want to make sure that your voice is shining through and you're using quotations as an extra to your paper rather than really driving the paper. And so... That's all that I have. And so I just wanted to know if you all had any questions. Sorry, I missed the, the chat here. So I'm gonna go back and um, look through the, the chat. RefWorks is a great um, option for um, citation managers. Is there a program for annotation? Um, not that I'm familiar with. Um, I do, I, I think annotation is best done um, by yourself. And so kind of um, getting your own understanding of what the research is and putting it into your own words, because then when you go to write your paper, you'll be able to use that that thought process when you're typing things out. Um, not, not necessarily, I would do it like on word keeping, like I keep an Excel document that I, um, that I add to, and I so I have the name of the article, the name of the journal, the name of the author, the keywords in different columns, and then the annotation. So that two paragraph, um, two or three paragraph uh, summary of the article. So that way it's helpful for me if I want to filter by certain keywords, I can 
filter all the different columns for whatever I am looking for. How should one approach typos in literature articles that have them and um, or a few instances of mismatched figures to the figure description? I think I, I can see it from both sides of the typos and the mismatched figures. Like I said, you'll never become a better writer than writing a lit review because you're going to see so many people's style. You're going to see things that people pay attention to that people don't pay attention to things that make sense and don't make sense. So like I was reading an article once and they said that in their original sample size description, they said that they had, I think, 150 participants. But when you then looked at the table, it only had results or the, the results of the t-test show that they only used data from maybe 90 people. And so you want to like, those are things that you're going to realize. And it's not to discredit the the author, but it's, when you see the methodological like um, kind of missteps like that, I think that um, the methodological, when you see a methodological error, that that should give you more pause than if you see something like a typo or mismatch figures, because I can read something there. You never become a better proofreader than when you submit something to a journal, right? You hit submit and then you're like, oh, I found five more typos, even though you've read it probably 50 times. And so things like that, I think it, are not as um, important to note when you're looking at articles. But if you see major methodological flaws or um, like that their, their figures or their graphs are not clear of what they're showing you, that's something to be more concerned about when you're reading the literature. Uh, sometimes I'm not clear when an article is peer reviewed, but the library and the li again, use the librarians. They are here to help you. They are amazing. Uh, I haven't met anybody but the two from the College of Ed and they are amazing. And so um, I can just assume that everybody else is. Um, they know how to help you search. They know how to help you do these evaluations. There's a lot of library guides that you can use when you are doing the research um, searching process, the literature search process, things like that. Just no one is in, no one should be in grad, like you have a whole community of support around you, whether that be faculty members, the grad school or the grad college, the grad academy, your the librarians, every people here want to see you succeed. And so using those resources is super important. A big thing just to re harp on this the most is that one, there's tons and tons and tons and tons. Like I said, you if you put in college athletes, I bet you a million articles would come up. That doesn't make every one of them good. Just because it's published does not mean it's good. Just because it's published doesn't mean that I need to include it. And so you want to make sure that you are intentional with your literature review to make sure that you're putting out the best research project you can. All right. Great note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Hoffman. I hope you all learned a lot. And I think I'll just reiterate what, what you said and what others have said is like, you have so many resources on campus to support you. And hopefully a part of this week is enhancing exposure to some of those. Um, so thank you all for joining us and um, I am going to go ahead and stop recording in a moment here. This will be available on YouTube and we'll also add it to your web campus course so that you can access it if you need to go back and, and review anything um, in the future. So thank you all again. I'm going to do that right now. Thank you all for coming. If you need anything, um, it, my email is just amanda.hoffman at unlv.edu. Thank you.